Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the press conference on energy access and energy poverty and a new climate deal that will tackle energy uh, poverty as well. Uh, today's speakers include Mr. Luis Auguste Casaña Caval of the Pan American Health Organization, uh, Mr. Fatih Biro from the International Energy Agency, and Mr. Olaf Shorven, uh, the UN Assistant um, Secretary General and Director of Policy at the United Nations Development Program. Mr. Shorven will also present the, uh, a new report, the energy access uh, situation in developing countries, the report as well as the uh, inter International Energy Agency's uh, World Energy Outlook report are available here in the room and on our website. Mr. Shorven, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to, to everyone. As we enter the final weeks ahead of the Copenhagen Climate Talks, it's uh, important to remember that, it is, uh, that what is needed to secure a sustainable future for everyone is a deal that works for climate change and development. And that has to include one with universal access to modern energy services. If that's not at the heart of it, it's not going to happen. And the report that we have been preparing and that is uh, the, uh, being presented here uh, today and available for, for all of you is a collaboration between uh, UNDP and WHO and with support also from the International Energy Agency that brings out the nature of this challenge and how the, the challenge of expanding energy access uh, is a challenge that is as much about achieving climate benefits as it is about achieving energy security and, and uh, energy access and dignified lives for billions of people. Expanding energy access is essential to accelerate efforts to reach the Millennium Development Goals. If the goal of halving the proportion of people living in poverty is to be met, 1.2 billion more people will need access to electricity and 2 billion people will need access to modern fuels like gas and propane, etc. And at present, almost half of humanity is completely disconnected from the debate on how to drive human progress with less emissions and greener energy. And their reality is, in fact, much more graphic or stark than that, because while we talk and discuss and negotiate, they carry heavy loads of water and food on their backs because they don't have transport. They cook over wood fires that damage their health, and not with electricity, gas, or oil. And to be more precise, three billion people, almost half of humanity, rely on solid fuels, which means traditional biomass, wood, dung, etc., and coal, because they don't have access to modern energy services. And as a result of this, two million deaths per year are associated with burning such solid fuels indoors in unventilated kitchens. And add to that that almost a quarter of the world's population, 1.5 billion people, still live in darkness. They don't have access to electricity. Over 80% of them in South Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa. We must ensure that the energy needs of these people are central to a new climate agreement. Their needs have to be met at the lowest cost and in the cleanest and most sustainable way possible to help developing countries establish a low carbon route to development. Because climate change demands that we develop a different and a more sustainable way than before. And I can tell you, and, uh, and my colleagues will talk more about this, that expanding energy access to modern energy services for these 1.5 billion people will uh, add only insignificantly to the overall uh, uh, emissions uh, envelope of the world. So emissions and greenhouse gases are not, no excuse for, for not moving ahead with, uh, with uh, providing energy access for poor people. Here at the UN, the International Energy Agency, UNDP, and WHO we're joining forces to articulate, advocate for, and address this problem. And we will be working together to contribute to the 
IEA flagship publica publication, World Energy Outlook, for 2010. And my colleague, Dr. Fatih Birol from IEA, will speak more to the recently launched 2009 World Energy Outlook. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we just had a very nice uh, meeting with the several ambassadors of United Nations to talk about the energy issues. Now, as I said there, I see three major challenges coming for the, uh, mankind or humankind, which are more or less uh, uh, converging. The first one, the first challenge is energy security. The second one is climate change. And the third one is energy and the poor. In terms of energy security, especially when we are in the, uh, in, uh, under the roof of the United Nations and so many developing countries are represented, I can tell you that the higher oil prices, energy prices, will be more of a burden for the economies of several uh, developing uh, nations, especially if we stick to the current energy policies and do not change our energy policies, which are based on fossil uh, uh, fuels, coal, oil, and gas. And this uh, burden, increasing oil and gas import bills for developing nations, mean hampering the economic growth. And if there is a spike in the uh, oil prices, gas prices, this may well have major effects for the economies, including their debt situation. And therefore, from an energy security point of view, current policies mean unsustainable for developing nations and also the nations of the uh, OECD industrialized nations. The second problem that we have highlighted in our World Energy Outlook, and I tried to do it also a, a couple of minutes ago to the uh, UN ambassadors, that the current energy trends bring us to a temperature increase up to 6 degrees Celsius in the next decades to come. And 6 degrees increase in the global temperature would have major implications for our planet, ranging from the availability of food to the change of our uh, agricultural uh, uh, culture, from uh, floods to the immigration, and many, many other implications. And as we all know, energy is responsible two-thirds of the emissions, and without changing the energy uh, system, we will not be able to find a solution to uh, climate change. And in that context, what will happen in Copenhagen is crucial to uh, send the right signals to the energy sector. And we have discussed this, and as uh, alternative options, we have highlighted the importance of using energy more efficiently, in making more use of renewable energies, wind, hydropower, solar, and the others, as well as uh, using nuclear power in a peaceful way in the countries where it is acceptable, accepted by their people. The third point that uh, uh, I uh, try to highlight as after uh, the energy security and climate change is energy and poor. Today, ladies and gentlemen, in sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, South Asia, 1.5 billion people have no access to electricity. This is a, not, a num not only a number. A mother cannot put the uh, medication uh, for her child in the refrigerator to, uh, to keep it in the refrigerator to give it to him or her uh, for the next day. No connection to the uh, uh, communication uh, uh, system. No light. This is very bad and this is something that the energy community and the others should be ashamed of. However, the situation is even worse when we look at the future. Despite the economic growth we expect in Sub-Saharan Africa, in India and elsewhere, we expect in 2030 there will be still 1.3 billion people who will have no access to electricity. And this is definitely unacceptable. It is unacceptable economically, it is unacceptable in uh, energy terms, and it's unacceptable in ethical terms. So therefore, we think this is the third and uh, the, uh, ch challenge the energy sector is facing. To sum up, all these challenges, energy security, climate change, and energy and the poor, should be in the agenda of uh, the nations in Copenhagen. It, it shouldn't be considered only as a meeting uh, to find a framework to address the climate change issue, but with the right signals coming from Copenhagen, I think the energy security issue, by giving a, a 
incentives for the low carbon technologies as well as putting the energy and poverty issue within the framework, I think all these three issues should be elevated in Copenhagen. And this was my appeal to the UN ambassadors a couple of minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, same way, we're coming from this important meeting uh, organized by UNDP. Thank you very much. This is a very important, not only for energy and uh, development, but also for public health. We know very clear today, based on the studies, that there are three main diseases that are affected by this use of energy or for not having access to regular energy. One is pneumonia in children under five years old. The other is chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases in adults over 30 years, and the other is lung cancer in adults over 30 years. Also, <coughs> we know that this kills 2 million, ba 2 million people per year, and uh, because of that, this is a tenth leading risk factor for death worldwide. It is more important than many of the other risks we have is the 16 leading risk factor for death in low-income countries and kills more than tobacco, physical inactivities, and high cholesterol in many of these countries. We also know by the WHO database that has been put together using data from 143 countries from the da from years 1974 to 2008, this is also about equity because its effect poorest country, particularly the sub-Saharan countries, and also affects more women and children. So correcting this situation is not only recovering public health conditions, but also is recovering public health conditions in the, in the less uh, developing countries and also in, uh, in women and children, so it's about equity. Finally, it's also not only about public health itself, but it's about climate change. And if it's about climate change, indir indirectly it's about health. Because we know that the climate change will have serious effects on, on health, not only because of the more extreme climate events, but also because many other consequences. We know basically uh, the increase of some of these important uh, warming pollutants like uh, black carbon, methane, and others. Finally, uh, uh, we will be addressing this together with the NDP and the International Agents for Energy uh, in, the, in the years for in coming, and we hope we can make progress. Next year, we have on the 7th of April the World Health Day that will be dedicated for urbanization and health, and we'll be addressing this hopefully out of a very good uh, understanding and a very good uh, piece of uh, collaboration out of Copenhagen. Thank you very much.